Hi, my name is Jim and today we're going to be talking about optical isolators or optocouplers, um, both mean the same thing. And what it is, it's a collection of a light emitting diode and a phototransistor, and this little arrow here represents light. Uh, relatives in the family are optically coupled SCR, silicon controlled rectifiers, and optically controlled triacs, which are the uh, the MOSFET for AC circuits if you will so there's a bunch of optical families and this is what we're going to start with is the most common so uh, what the purpose of the part is is to take a relatively hostile environment and isolate it from a relatively friendly environment and by that I mean the hostile environment may involve high voltages and or high currents and the friendly environment uh, environment may include say a microcontroller and uh, an example is this little guy which was used for uh, preschool 911 training and the opto isolator is this little guy here this is in a dip package dual inline package it has six leads and uh, it isolates the five volts that are used for uh, two uh, microchip processors from 24 volts plus a nasty 80 some volt ringing signal um, and what it does is it converts dial pulses into 5 volts <coughs> based on the possibility that a young child may be at grandma, grandmother's house and they have a rotary dial phone um, so that's what that's for get it down into 5 volts so we don't have to worry about any high voltage damaging the microcontroller uh, also another example would be um, this is a uh, smart cable and what it does is it connects from a computer via USB to a little box with a whole lot of electronics in it and then this would plug into a board with a microprocessor on it. Now the company that makes this makes a lot of motor control ICs because brushless motors are really a big deal in the drill market. Now you're talking about possibly a 19 volt lithium ion battery short circuiting this and feeding it back through the um, smart cable into a computer USB port which is 5 volts not so good you don't want to blow up the computer so they have a type of this which is optically isolated so this can be working at 120 volts without issue and so is the controller it's sitting on top of a, a say 120 volt DC and since it's optically controlled there's no possibility for hostile voltages to get back into USB uh, and, and do damage to the computer so they're, they're everywhere um, computer power supplies are switch mode and um, I'll put an example up one later example of one up later so uh, the dots here show that these two parts are integrated and uh, this is an infrared light emitting diode and uh, the reason it's infrared is because the most sensitive point on an opto transistor is at the infrared frequency. So what this transistor is basically is an exposed transistor. It doesn't have any plastic around it. It's just the silicon which is available to be struck by photons being emitted by the infrared light emitting diode. Uh, when a photon strikes <clears throat> and we'll just draw a simple um, NPN symbol here. When a photon strikes in the depletion region, it has the ability of generating an electron hole pair. So it adds to the energy of the outermost electron, uh, the fifth valence electron of the donor, and when that energy becomes available, then you have current flow um, through the device. Oops, wrong direction there. So instead of using base current to drive this, it's being driven by the energy of photons. And it is selective. Some photons of lower energy won't generate free electron in the conduction band, and some electrons of higher energy, believe it or not, won't either. <clears throat> so anyway, that's a brief overview. And the part we're going to be looking at here, and I've selected a surface mount part to be um, somewhat uh, up to date, is an LTV 356T family and the company that made it is named Light On and uh, the ratings of this and this is what we'll kind of look at 
is that the I forward max is 50 milliampers, which means that the absolute maximum that you can have flowing in this direction is going to be 50 milliampers. And notice that it is flowing through the diode, conventional current as always. The reverse voltage across this, and reverse means that we're going to be making the cathode positive with respect to the anode, is only 6 volts. Now what that says is this diode is not meant to rectify. It's meant to emit light, so no provisions have been made made to try to get the reverse breakdown voltage up to a high level. The forward voltage, and that's going to be the voltage drop across the light emitting diode when it's turned on, is 1.2 volts typical. Now, previously we talked about LEDs and uh, for red, green, yellow, orange, they sat around 2.2 volts. Well, infrared light has less energy than visible light. So the band gap, that's the difference between the uh, valence band and the conduction band is narrower. So it doesn't take as much energy to move an electron from the valence band into the conduction band. And uh, because of that, the forward drop is 1.2 volts. So infrared light has less energy per photon and visible light has less energy than ultraviolet light, has less energy than x-rays, has less energy than cosmic rays. Okay, so the reverse current is uh, basically the leakage current. So if we applied this polarity, reverse biasing the light emitting diode, they're saying that the worst case leakage current here is 10 microamperes and the test value is 4 volts. So when you get into the data sheet, they'll give you a number and the conditions under which that, that um, number is derived uh, from the circuit they set up to make the test. So if we take a look at the output transistors, what we see is that infrared is, is impinging on the, uh, the, the junction here and that's going to set up a current flow as with a normal transistor in this direction. Some optoisolators have a base connection. This one does not. So <clears throat> uh, this here is going to be the current flow uh, and it's called dark current and that is when the light emitting diode, which I didn't draw here, is off. Uh, I would be equal to zero milliampere is completely off. So let's look at this, this variable here. This is a little bit different than a doubly subscripted variable because it has, well, three transcript, uh, three subscripts. I, C, E, so that's going to decompose into the current between the uh, collector and the emitter. And the zero here means that the third element, in this case would be the base, is open. So this is supplying the names of two elements and the third element is open. Sometimes it'll be S for shorted. Sometimes it'll be X, meaning that there's a resistor connected to it. But the dark current, when there is no um, light being created by the light, uh, light emitting diode, is 100 nanoamperes maximum. So that's the worst case leakage that you're going to get through the device when it's completely turned off. Next, looking at the transistor, we see breakdown voltage, collector to emitter, and again, the third element is, in this case, left open. So the breakdown voltage means the voltage from here to here. And this would be plus, and this would be minus, and that comes in at 80 volts, and that's a minimum specification. So every single part that you buy is guaranteed not to break down with 80 volts applied to it. Um, the maximum will say maybe 90, but you never ever want to design for this specification on a maximum because this batch of transistors may be 90 and this batch may be 85 and this batch may be 80 depending upon the manufacturer and so forth, but this is a guaranteed minimum. Now let's flip things around here. This is breakdown voltage emitter to collector, base open which basically uh, flips the symbols here. Let me draw that up. That makes this plus and this minus 
and this only comes in at 6 volts. Now that's not very much and when you think about an NPN structure P N and N so, um, the way I draw it and the way a lot of textbooks draw it is it kind of looks symmetrical like really what's the difference between the emitter N and the collector N and the answer as you can see here is well a lot now the reason that is is first off the collector many times this end is connected to the heat sink of the device get rid of the heat and this is lightly doped which we can specify as N minus now what that means is that when and remember that in the active mode there's four modes for transistors the active mode uh, means that there's uh, reverse bias between the base and the collector so if this is N minus what that means is the depletion region extends far into the collector now the depletion region is the place where since it's reverse biased there are no free carriers so by lightly doping this is the depletion region is made larger which means that the field which is going to be the voltage between the collector and the base is spread out across this area therefore if desire is that not enough of E field will cause electrons to break through from their um, conduction band into the from the valence band into the conduction band based upon the voltage across the device so if we wanted to make this voltage higher all we would have to do would make this doping um, lighter and that has some other bad consequences too now the emitter on the other hand is typically heavily doped and I'm not going to write an N plus I will I'll write it down N plus here because this junction is typically forward biased so uh, P section is typically very thin it's not very deep and it's lightly doped so that a majority of electrons end up crossing the junction but an NPN is, is not a symmetrical device these ends are not created equal and you can clearly see that by this huge variation in the breakdown voltage of a device so if you get a transistor in backward uh, it may work remember this is going to be a maximum but uh, or a minimum but it's uh, you know, it's likely to break down the gain characteristics can go from well let's see for 2 in 3904 the minimum is 60 the max is 300 so I tested this once in the when I had the transistor backward the gain was 10 so I have to be careful and not reverse it so here's the transfer characteristics and what that has to do with is the ability of current flowing into the lead uh, which can also be a function of voltage if we had a resistor in here as to current flowing out of the transistor now the physical currents are going to be in this direction <coughs> and in this direction so it's about how much current here ends up being available over on the other side of the device so uh, what we have here is that the minimum amount of uh, collector current is 2.5 mils and the maximum is 30. So we, we want to stay above 2.5 because another characteristic we'll talk about shortly will be uh, drastically affected. This is V collector to emitter so we would break that down um, in typical style for a doubly subscriptive variable and sat says saturation now what the word means not that we're going to dwell on this is the voltages across the transistor are such that both the emitter and base are forward biased and the collector and base are forward biased that's the definition of saturation now we're not going to dwell into that much but there's 0.2 volts is the sat voltage and the conditions under which this was measured is the forward current into the light emitting diode was 20 milliampers and the collector current is 1 milliampere so with this situation is what we're seeing is we would have 0.2 volts 
carrying across the output and that would be the minimum voltage that the transistor can um, can drop so if we're using this in a digital envir environment uh, why not we would expect the low voltage to be 0 0.2 and not 0 and that's usually not a problem with um, uh, the devices we use the 3.3 volt and sub 3.3 volt components let's see here we have our isolation now what this is about is what is the resistance between this diode and this transistor measured across the case and this comes out to be 5 times 10 to the 10th ohms for minimum and the typical value, sorry, made a mistake there, is 1 times 10 to the 11th ohms. So there's a lot of resistance between the two of them. Now the key part of this is what is the breakdown voltage? So we have BV in this case is equal to 1500 volts RMS. So, there can be 1500 volts between the two of these. And this is operating in a circuit, and this is operating in the circuit, and as long as we don't exceed these, we're not going to have any arcs going across and shorting things out. So, across the device, you have this 1500 volts. Uh, that doesn't have to be, but that would be the maximum. Now, the device is laid out just like this in the package. So if we have a package like this, the transistor leads are going to be on this side as far away as possible from the light emitting diode leads which are on this side. So the circuit board under the worst case conditions here is going to see the 1500 volts across it. So um, have to be careful not to run any traces underneath this guy because that could very much compromise not the part, but the circuit's ability is not to arc over under those circumstances. Also, in the data sheet, you may see this being 1500 volts DC, and 1500 volts uh, RMS is a little bit more robust of a part because remember the peak on this is going to be that voltage times 1.414. So uh, having said that, uh, we do in fact see that there is resistive isolation and considerable amount of voltage isolation also, and uh, both of those are what the device is designed to do. You know, uh, here we have a CNC controller, and over here we have a great big CNC motor or something like that. And this, of course, would have to feed other circuitry like perhaps Tri-X and sit maybe at 220 or 440 volts AC if it's a big machine. So it makes sense to have a part like this. C float is given in the data sheet and that's going to be the capacitance between this side and this side as a worst case of one picofarad. So much for that. We can operate this in digital mode as I said before. The T rise time, uh, and this is going to be typical, is 4 uh, this should be um, nanoseconds. Let me make that nanoseconds. And the fall time is 3 nanoseconds typical. So, what the rise and fall time is, is if the rise time is the time it takes to go from 10% to 90%. And the fall time, as you can probably guess, is the time it takes to go from 90% down to 10%. And this is industry defined. And the reason that these is not, is not from 0 to 100 is many times if we're dealing with a fast signal we'll have undershoot here perhaps and overshoot here. So where do we measure relative to? And that's why they picked a 10 and a 90% so we can eliminate pre-shoot and post-shoot on an edge. So that's an industry standard at 10 and 90. Good thing to keep that in mind. Uh, the worst case on this is going to be um, uh, 18 nanoseconds. And let me project that. What it means is the time for rise would be this. And the time for fall would be this. So they're giving us that for digital reasons. We can use this as in a, in a digital circuit, as I said, or 
uh, also in an analog circuit. Now we get down to a very critical uh, parameter, and this is called CTR, and uh, that's called the uh, control transfer ratio is equal to the collector current here divided by the forward current here times 100 percent and what the specifications for this part says is that the minimum is 50 percent now what that means is that if we had say um, well, this is current transfer ratio not what I said before current transfer ratio so what that means is that if we had one or say 10 milliampers flowing in here that would translate to 5 milliampers flowing here that would be a CTR of 50 percent so that's what it is minimum and for the maximum we have 600 percent which means that if we had 10 milliampers flowing here we could have 60 milliampers flowing in this direction so there's quite a differentiation in the variability of some of these components and when you're doing a design you have to use the worst case number and sometimes that's a max and sometimes that's a minimum and it just depends upon what the parameter is you're looking for <coughs> so uh, the CTR very important and it's not linear by the way and uh, you'll see this in lab and there's not enough room on this diagram to sketch it so I'll do that uh, in a minute here and I'll, let me sketch it right here before I forget about it typical CTR would uh, look like this where there'd be a maximum and remember this is a ratio of the collector current divided by the collector voltage uh, the light emitted from the diode is typically very linear related to the current but the overall combination of the two leads us to this and we're going to be uh, plotting this in in the lab so there is a maximum and in your calculations uh, you end up with an undefined over the corner here so be a little bit careful with that. Okay, so we go down. And, uh, talked about the specifications a little bit. And um, let's talk about an example. Now, this is a switch mode power supply, which is found in every computer power supply. A 400 watt computer power supply, which was linear, using 60 hertz transformers, would weigh a lot. And because there's switch mode, and a transformer has to store energy for half the period. So, for 60 hertz that would be 8.3 milliseconds and it needs a lot of iron to do that and the higher the frequency is the smaller the transfer uh, the transformer is because it, it only has to store energy for a shorter period of time and that's the whole claim to fame of this is um, get a switcher going here and um, end up with a small transformer high power lightweight and all that's good so this little diagram I here is, have here is based upon a power supply for a fiber optic transmitter receiver bank and uh, uh, techs used to repair this and the voltage comes into this 120 volt and that's called the AC mains with an S on it and that's the language and because uh, if you flip the power switch on this you take out a whole bunch of fiber optic channels switches on the back okay so what we have here is a voltage doubler so at this point we're talking about 300 to 340 volts DC keeping in mind the peak of this that's a lot and it's sitting on this filter capacitor and the energy of a filter capacitor is equal to one half CV squared so that squared is uh, significant and um, can have enough energy to really hurt you. <laughs>
not kill you if you get across it like you know both hands were going to uh, close across the, your, your heart cavity. This is fed into a high frequency transformer and I've shown this is not a solid iron core but a ferrite core and it's being switched by a MOSFET. Now this is called a flyback power supply and uh, the FET turns on, builds a magnetic field and when it collapses it induces a voltage in the secondary and there are variations in theme on this. Uh, this is the technique used prior to LCD TVs to get the 25 to 30 thousand volts necessary on a relatively large screen color television. So we've got this FET operating here and is turning on and off uh, operating in a binary mode to be most efficient and uh, we have to kind of control it somehow. So in this example what's happening is we have a secondary winding on this which is electrically isolated from the primary. It's feeding a half wave rectifier and remember that this is at high frequencies so we don't have any large demands on the filter cap and 5 volts from this is being fed back into the light emitting diode of the auto isolator and notice that this now is backward, uh, drawn backward rather, that couples over into the phototransistor which feeds into the pulse width modulator controller. So this is the friendly side of a computer. This is where you get your 5 volts and your 12 volts to run a motor and a disk drive and 3.3 uh, .3 or 1.8 volt for the processor or whatever and this is safe over here. This side, on the other hand, there is no isolation. And if we say had a bad part here and take a scope ground to plug in and see what's going on, we had better make sure that that scope ground ends up on this point. Now I've shown two grounds in this, and these are different. Um, the simulation software uh, calls one an analog ground and the other one a digital ground. So because the ground symbols are ground symbols, if they're different does not mean they're connected. They may be, but they may not be. So uh, one of the things when doing, when working on this, and the first thing I did is uh, went out and bought some isolation transformers. So a scope probe in the wrong place isn't going to cause a short through the green wire. Pop a circuit breaker and I've actually seen the pigtails on the scopes melt because of things like this. Uh, and you obviously have to be very careful when working in this area. Very careful. Since these voltages are quite high, uh, scope needs to have, probably have an X10 probe in it uh, to, uh, to do some troubleshooting. So I call this the hostile side of a circuit and this uh, friendly side of a circuit. And what the intent of this is, is you can see that the opto coupler, the opto isolator, is feeding back information to the controller about the state of affairs on the other side of this so it can attempt some uh, some regulation. Uh, a lot of variations in theme obviously this is just to serve as an example but it's not unrealistic. Now let's take a look at passing audio through an opto isolator just for the heck of it and um, what happens here is that the audio source is going to forward bias the diode when it goes positive and this is going to be the reverse bias so no current is going to flow here and remember is that the breakdown voltage on this is going to be 6 volts. So what happens in the output is since it only conducts on the positive part of the input cycle is we get an inverted output and it appears to be rectified and where the um, where the current uh, doesn't flow through the light emitting diode is where we have these flat spots and this is going to be sitting on a DC potential plus and this will be ground if we bias this correctly. So very nonlinear if we don't take some precautions. So uh, we can couple analog signals through an opto isolator it's just that we have to uh, kind of expect things not to look that good. Now, a way of doing it without having that rectification effect is to bias the lead at some point and then let the AC component or 
we'll say audio component right on top of that. So what we see if we look at this at this point is we have a DC component and an AC component which is going to be swinging up and down and we never want to cut the lead off or go below its minimum and uh, we never want to have more than 50 milliamp years flowing because that's the maximum of lead. Now on the transistor side is what we see is an inverted signal and instead of being very bad it's just not so good. The current transfer ratio as I have sketched down here is anything but linear. It varies depending upon the forward current of the lead. So what we're seeing in the output here, what I tried to show was a sine wave who is not symmetrical, meaning that there's distortion introduced into the sine wave because of the nonlinearity which is associated with the optocoupler. So uh, that's the, uh, the optocoupler, optoisolator, a very common part um, and they're used a lot in industrial and uh, this is just to give you a little bit of familiarity about what they are and uh, what they're used for. So, uh, alright, this insert is included in the Apto Isolator video uh, because the transfer characteristics both from the lead to the transistor side and the transistor to the lead side uh, in my opinion were not adequately explained in the first video so this is to take care of that issue. Transfer details. So uh, what we have here is an optical isolator as you can see. Uh, 12 volt supply, 1K load, V out. And what we're going to do in this case is we're going to start on the transistor side to meet some other criteria over here which is not specified and work backward and find out what the lead characteristics should be as far as current is concerned. And if we wanted to, we could find out what the, um, what the resistance value for limiting lead currents leads always need to have a series limiting resistor unless you're kind of pushing a battery and a flashlight to do the job for you. Anyhow, here we have a current transfer ratio of 110 and we're going to start by letting the collector current equal 1.4 milliamperes. Um, and just a review, CTR of 110 means that a 100%, 110% more current is going to flow in the uh, collector than in the lead circuit. And then the decimal value that we need for that would be uh, 1.10 when we're actually doing calculations. So having said that, uh, we're given this IC and here's the equation. The collector current is equal to 1.10 times the lead current. And then what we can find from that going backward is that uh, solving for, uh, in this case, I lead is we end up with 12.72 milliamperes. So what you note on this is that the lead current is less than the collector current and the reason is is that the CTR is greater than 100 percent. So if you need to work backward uh, that's the way you do it. Now to find out what these values would be and suppose um, I let this be, I don't know, 5 volts we'll say and this can be a data stream, no reason why it cannot be and uh, uh, to find the resistor value here is it would simply be 5 volts minus the operating drop of the light emitting diode and for infrared LEDs that's about 1.4, 1.45 volts visible LEDs uh, excepting for blue and white sit around 2.2, 2.3 volts so I uh, would be minus 1.45 volts and then we divide that by the current we just found which is 12.75 milliamperes and that would give us this, uh, our limiting resistor. So uh, in this case you need to know tolerances and when you design things always design conservatively. You have to be very careful what columns you pick, minimum, typical or maximum on a data sheet when you're doing things. So this is the technique of starting at the transistor side and working back to the lead. Now let's go on a little bit here. Uh, suppose, uh, and this is where things get a little bit complicated, suppose that the lead current is 15 milliamperes and we're going to let the saturation voltage of the transistor be 0.45 volts.
and what that means is that if it's fully saturated the technical definition of that is that the base emitter and base collector uh, junctions are forward biased in a typical amplifier where VC is expected to swing say with an audio signal say between 12 volts and ground the base emitter is forward biased but the base collector is reverse biased so the definition of saturation is quite real and the bad thing about it is is that the entire junction gets saturated with carriers and when you go to turn it off it takes time for these carriers to move toward the collector and emitter terminals and uh, in so doing the turnoff time is uh, relatively slow now there are ways of fixing that uh, for example Schottky diode clamping this so it can't go into saturation heavily a MOS transistor doesn't have the issue at all but I've never seen an optically coupled a coupled MOS transistor and so forth so a couple things uh, basically how fast can you transfer data if that's what you want to do so what we want to do here is find VC uh, the collector voltage um, given these uh, parameters up here and what we know is that the collector current is equal to the lead current times the CTR and uh, the uh, we're told that I lead is 14 mils and it fixes that times a CTR expressed as a decimal of 1.4 will give us 21 milliampers so that would be the collector current that we get and again that makes sense 14 mils here a CTR greater than 100 percent would produce a collector current which is greater than a lead current so in this case what I've allowed this uh, resistor to be is 360 ohms and that's a strange value but I did it for a reason so uh, we want to find out what the drop is across that 360 resistor before we can find out what the collector voltage is and that's easy enough to do um, the drop is um, simply this component 360 times 21 mils and let me get him out of the way here which ends up being 4.4 volts so that's the voltage drop now we want to find the output and keep in mind that voltage drop does not refer to ground it's the voltage across the resistor to make it useful in a circuit we have to anchor one end of it and in this case we're going to anchor one end to 12 volts hence we end up with this and what I did for is I just wrote, wrote the equation down to find out what that would be and I mistakenly put a 12 volts in there but anyway the collector current is then equal to 12 minus the drop across this resistor which would be plus to minus and that gives us a collector voltage of 7.6 volts so uh, all is well as long as we're not uh, we're not transferring digital traffic now same problem only we're going to let the collector resistance be equal to one kilo ohm and let's see what happens again we start out by finding the drop across the collector resistor which is 1k 21, 21 milliampers times 1k gives us 21 volts and that 21 milliampers comes from the CTR value so if we go to find the collector voltage the same way we did before is what we end up with is a negative 9 volts now seeing that the supply here um, the most negative voltage is 0 volts and we don't have any inductor and capacitors that can kick us down to some negative value this is not possible so what's going on here is that um, the circuit doesn't let the CTR determine collector current the circuit won't support it and the circuits the boss so to speak so what that means basically is that the transistor is saturated and we have to fall back and use a different technique to figure out what the output voltage will be so in this case um, the out is simply going to be equal to 12 volts minus the saturation voltage which is 0.45 volts and uh, that will give us uh, 11.55 milliampers for the collector current now 
how do you know this? If, I mean, you have situations where it can be operating in a linear mode or in saturation mode, and the answer to that basically is you don't know. You do the calculation, find the V drop, then you go for VC, and if it doesn't make sense, then you use this technique to find the output. Doesn't make sense means that the absolute lowest value that can be here at the collector is VCE sat, which is 0 0.45 volts. So any answer here in the range of this would be 0 0.45 volts down to any negative value means that the transistor is saturated. So you kind of have to make the test to find that out. And in MOSFETs, it's the same problem. Um, it's extremely important, as we'll see on the next sheet, if you're operating in a digital environment, that the transistor works between saturation and the supply voltage. So think about this. It should make sense to you. And V-drop is the magic here. Um, and when you subtract that from your supply voltage, you have to analyze the answer. You know, just don't write down negative 9 because the calculator says so. You know, critically think. Does it make sense or not? Always use common sense. So, uh, here we have an optoisolator and we're interfacing with digital logic. And I've designated this as the H74HC family. It's CMOS and we do not have to be concerned with any input currents of this. Um, Miller currents, yeah, but we won't worry about that. They're small in this particular device. Quite unlike a MOSFET, it has huge um, currents that charge capacitors inside the device, but that's not an issue here. If we're using TTL, long since obsolete, the high voltage is 360 microamperes, and that would be flowing into it, and the low voltage would be one. 0.6 milliampere is flowing out of it, and we would have to take that into account. But TTL is long gone. CMOS is the standard bearer, so it gives us the luxury of not having to worry about a load connected to the um, uh, V out. And I say that in due respect to the circuit speed operation because there is a capacitive load on this. So uh, to start with here, we're going to let our lead uh, voltage be 1.45 volts. And here we have a CTR range. And this will be in the data sheet. A minimum is 85, which is less than uh, 1. And this is in percent. Typical is 110 and max is 140. Now usually a data sheet will only give you two of these. In this case it would be um, minimum and typical. Sometimes they'll give you typical and max. It depends on what's the worst case. Sometimes it's the minimum and sometimes it's the maximum. In the case of the lead voltage drop, we would be interested in the maximum drop. So um, we're letting uh, the VCE saturation, uh, worst case, be 0 0.45 volts and the best case be 0 0.35 volts. So we want to use the uh, 450 millivolt um, range. Now our supply on this LED, since it is digital, is shown as digital logic coming here between 0 and 5 volts, and that's called V data. And ultimately what we want to do maybe is find out what the LED current would be, and also what would be the value of the LED limiting resistor. So uh, what we want to do is design a reliable circuit, spelled correctly, and uh, the steps to do that is to um, realize that the output is digital and the output voltage has to swing basically from rail to rail and in this case that's going to be determined by uh, by the devices now when the transistors off getting up to 5 volts is no problem no current flow through the 1k resistor means the voltage drop is zero and anytime you have a voltage drop equal to zero volts what that means is the voltage on both sides of the resistor are the same so that would produce an output here of 5 volts. And for a minimum here, we'd like to see maybe to hit 0 volts, but we can't do that. So the lowest we can go in this case is VCE saturation. Now, 
before we begin a design, it would be really, really good to look at the 74HC datasheet and find out what its maximum allowable low voltage is. Because if this is sitting at or above the maximum, we're real close to the threshold point where the IC actually changes. And it's an undefined zone. Meaning, and let me just draw this real quick, if this were to be, I'll say, 5 volts, and this were to be VN minimum high, VN maximum low, any actual low has to be below the line between 0 and here, and any high has to be between this and 5 volts. This is the transition zone. You're allowed to go through it you're not allowed to camp in. And the reason is, is somewhere in here is the device's actual threshold what determines the difference between 1 and 0. And it's not well defined. It could be anywhere around the center of this. So we have to be safe that we don't operate very close to this because what that does is it wrecks the noise margin. A little pulse on there and we get, you know, a glitch in the output. So you always have to really look at your family, and they differ. And different families have different uh, maximum low voltages and minimum high voltages, and you want to stay within that. Because the circuit works doesn't mean it works. Is it going to work in a car where the temperature in the in the sun is perhaps 120 degrees? So conservative is always good. So anyway, um, what we want to do here is. Um, uh, since we're limited by a circuit, is uh, we're going to be shooting for that. And what we have to do is choose a collector current um, that is conservative. So if we start out, we can look at the actual minimum. Now, the minimum is going to be 5 volts minus 0 0.45 volts divided by the collector resistor here, which is 1K, and that comes out to be 4.55 milliamperes. Yeah. Okay. Now, if we're using a resistor with a 10% tolerance, and that's really high, um, typically they run within 5%, what we see is that for this circuit to work is that, that the collector current now increases to 5.05 milliamperes. So we don't know what tolerance is going to be in the circuit, so designing conservatively, I let IC equal 6 milliamperes, the collector current. Now, since I've got a safe value here that I'm satisfied with, uh, we need to work backward into this circuit again. So uh, what we want to do is find the lead current, um, and what we have to do to do that is use the worst case CTR. Not the best case, not the typical. How bad can it be? And that will give us a conservative lead current that will work no matter what the CTR is. So in doing that, um, worst case is specified as 85, which means 0.85% of the lead current will be transferred into the collector if the circuit permits. Um, and then working that out is uh, what we see here is the collector current times lead equals lead current times CTR. Solving for I lead and using the 85% uh, CTR gives us 7.06 milliamperes and then to be conservative I'm going to allow that to be 7.5 milliamperes. Um, next uh, what we have to do is uh, convert the 443 ohms here, or that's the answer, to find our lead. Now realistically I could elect to use the 5% resistor tolerance on this too only that tolerance would be the high tolerance of the lead, not the low, because the high would reduce the lead current. So when you're working with tolerances, it depends upon what, where, and when, you know, so to speak. Uh, the circuit has to dictate what tolerance you're using to come up with a good design. So uh, knowing that, <coughs> Um, the resistor that limits current into the lead here is going to be 5 volts minus the voltage drop across the lead divided by the lead current, 5 volts minus 1.45 volts 
divided by 7.5 um, milliampere gives us an R of 473 ohms. Now when you get a value like that uh, you're going to have to round it and 473 is so close to 470 as I would use a 470 resistor. Otherwise I would round it conservatively that is to say make the lead current higher. So uh, that's, that's the follow up on this. Uh, thanks for watching.